Peter Kenneth Bostrom Linden was born on February 15, 1972, in Zeeland, Denmark. His father Ola Linden was born in 1935 in Denmark, and his mother Anna Schaffner Linden was born in Germany also in 1935. Ola Linden immigrated to Canada with his family whilst he was still a child, and in 1950 Ola and his brother had moved to the United States with the purpose of joining the United States Army. The US Army had allowed them to keep their Danish citizenship, which they would have had to give up if they had joined the Canadian Army. Ola's brother was sent to be stationed in Korea, where he unfortunately passed on soon after his arrival, when he contracted a virus. Ola had ended up being stationed in West Germany, we had met a young German girl named Anna Schaffner. The pair got married after dating for a while. Anna's father had also been in the army, so becoming an army wife was something that Anna had knowledge on growing up with a father in the army. The couple later settled in Denmark where Ola had originally been from. There he got a job as a bricklayer and he built the couple's beautiful house right on the beach on Solrod Strand himself. The couple had tried for several years to have a baby, and finally, at the age of 37, the couple had welcomed their baby boy Peter. But the pressure of having a new baby, and being far away from her family, seemed too much for Anna. She soon developed an issue with alcohol abuse. Both her parents and Ola's parents came to visit them at one point to meet their new grandchild, during this visit, she would send the grandparents out with the baby on a walk, and when they would return, they would smell alcohol on her breath. Anna started drinking more and more, and this led to her becoming verbally abusive to her husband and son, but the abuse was more so focused towards Peter. In 1979, Ola suffered a blood clot, which meant that he had to reduce his working hours. Due to this, the family had struggled financially, and their house was put in foreclosure. They had family living in Florida that suggested that the family make the move to America, and in 1980, they decided to emigrate to the United States of America, seeking the American dream, with their then 8-year-old son Peter. They had bought a house on Essex Drive in the town of Ormond Beach, Florida, where they ran a motel for a few years. In 1984, the family moved again to the area of Maggie Valley, North Carolina. The atmosphere in their house did not change, however. It was as thick as the mist on the Smoky Mountains on Sundays. A childhood friend of Peter's told how Peter's mom was regularly drunk and verbally abusive to him, and that sometimes she even got physically violent, where she would throw things at him. He said that there were no warm feelings between Peter and his mother, but that Peter had always tried to turn his mom's abusive words into a joke. There seemed to be no warm feelings between Ola and Anna either. The pair continuously fought and it sometimes ended up with either one of them being abusive towards the other and Peter watching on. The school that Peter had attended started wondering about what had been happening in Peter's home life. Although he had been a quiet child, he started acting aggressively towards other kids. He also pushed things too far during football and wrestling matches. One day, while on the bus going home from school, Peter started beating another boy, who had said something that Peter did not like. Allegedly, Peter wouldn't stop beating him, until the bus was pulled over and he was physically pulled from the child. Social services were contacted to get involved, and when several home inspections and visitations were done, 12-year-old Peter was removed from their home and placed in a foster home. Anna was accused of child neglect and abuse, but the investigation was soon dropped and Peter had been placed back in his parental home within three months of being removed. The very first night that Peter returned home, his mom allegedly threatened to strangle him, the police had been called to their home, but no charges were laid against her. Around two years later, Ola had enough of the relationship and decided to leave Anna, taking Peter with him. To 
together the two of them initially settled in Los Angeles, where they stayed for a few weeks. They then tried to make a living in New York City, but this too was unsuccessful. They then tried staying in Boston, but eventually their journey ended in Miami, where Olaf found an apartment and started working as a bricklayer again. Not long after the pair were settled there, Ola and Anna got back together, with the father and son bringing Anna down to Florida from North Carolina, and they tried to start afresh as a family. During this time, Peter worked various jobs in his spare time, including as a waiter at a restaurant, and on the day that he turned 16, he left school and decided to begin working as a bricklayer with his father. It was during this period of time that he first became acquainted with substances, such as the white snorting powder and the green herb. You all know what I'm talking about. The family, however, decided to move back to Maggie Valley at one point, and Peter decided to start up school again at the local high school. We, he allegedly started selling the green herb to his classmates. Anna's drinking seemed to get worse and worse. She was isolated and didn't make friends easily. Ola again decided that him and Anna needed to part ways. He decided that it might be easier for her if she returned to Germany and stayed with her family, as she was obviously not happy in America. She flew out to Germany and stayed with her family for a little, but very soon she returned to Maggie Valley to stay with Ola and Peter again. This time though, the tables seemed to have turned, and the aggressor soon became the victim to her husband and son. Peter had gotten deeper and deeper into substances and he and his father started drinking together on a regular basis. Often drunk, they now started verbally and physically abusing Anna. Neighbors often heard loud arguments between the three, and on several occasions the police had been called to the family home. But again, no charges were laid against any of them. Allegedly, during one of these occasions, Ola and Peter had tied Anna to a chair and beaten her and in two separate incidents, it was reported that had broken her arm. Peter also told people that he and his father spoke about killing Anna on several occasions. On what is estimated to be 1 April 1991, but could not be confirmed as the exact date, as they were all drunk most of the time, some sort of quarrel started up in the London house again. A drunken Anna wanted to cut off Peter's long hair, that he seemed to have been very proud of. Peter did not want a haircut, however. Anna came at Peter with a pair of scissors and held onto his long hair and kept tugging at it trying to cut it. Peter got hold of his mother's shirt collar and pulled on it until he felt her go limp. She fell to the floor and he saw her open her eyes. He looked at her and walked away and he decided to go to a party. When he later returned home, he saw that his mom was still lying where he had left her previously, and he realized soon that she had passed away. Together with his father, they drove his mom's body to the city of Buxton and buried her on the white sandy beaches of Cape Hatteras, more than 500 miles away from where they had lived. On November 1, 1991, some people were out for a walk on the beach near the lighthouse at the Outer Banks in Buxton, when they had discovered a partially buried body on the shore. The body was wrapped in a blue blanket, covered with black plastic and wrapped with tape and a yellow rope. The body was identified to be that of a female and had been in severe state of decomp. It took the police four months to try and identify the body, with no success. A break in the case soon came when Anna was reported missing by her family in Germany. They had been unable to reach Anna, Ola or Peter for a period of time, and they had been concerned that something might have happened to them. When the police learned of their turbulent home life, they became suspicious that either Peter or Ola or both of them had something to do with the death of Anna. Peter and his father had since fled to Canada, but on June 6, 1992, they were both arrested at a Toronto hotel room where they had been hiding out. I was asleep in my hotel room and I just heard this noise. And uh, next thing you know, I just the SWAT team was there, had a shotgun in my face. 
Peter had said that he did not know why authorities interfered in something that had been a private matter and that he did not want to go to jail for something that had been an accident, which is why he did everything he could to escape. The pair went on trial a year later and Peter pled guilty to manslaughter in July 1993. He was sentenced to 20 years imprisonment. At the same time, his father Ola was sentenced to two years as an accomplice. They were also ordered to both be deported to Denmark upon their release. Peter was outspoken and aggressive and got into fights on a regular basis during his prison stay and he was also remanded for his drug use. He also spent time in isolation due to his violent and aggressive behaviour towards other inmates. In 1994, Lunden was interviewed by a Danish TV channel, TV2, during his stay in prison. The broadcast was about how young Danes had gone across the Atlantic seeking the American dream. It was by chance that Lunden took part in the program. One of the producers randomly browsed a newspaper and it was there that they came across the story of Peter, a Danish citizen that had been convicted of murdering his mom. The organiser wrote a letter to London and asked if he would participate in an interview for Danish television. London replied stating, I would like that very much. The formalities were arranged with the American prison authorities, who had a very liberal attitude towards inmates being interviewed. During the interview, he discusses his childhood and what great friends he had been with his parents. And how was your relationship with your mother and your dad? Oh, me and my parents, we had a great, uh, they were not just my parents, they were my friends as well. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, my, my parents are, uh, they were like, you know, we were, uh, we were a family. Sure. He was filmed while walking outside with his hair blowing in the wind, with sunglasses on, staring out beyond the fence of the prison. He sang and played guitar for them. And he had them film him whilst he was working out in the gym. The most bizarre part of the interview came when he coloured one part of his face black and the other white to symbolise good and evil. He also recited a poem whilst painting his face. I mean, I'm showing everybody that if there's a high, there's a low. There's pleasure, there's pain. There's insanity, there's sane. There's silent, there's to tell. There's heaven, there's hell. There's peace, there's war. There's less, there's more. There's high, there's low. There's yes, there's no. There's ice, there's fire. There's honest, there's liar. There's love, there's hate. There's fat, there's fate. There's always, there's never. There's the past, forever. There's day, night, dark light. Wild, tame, smack, cane. Right, bra, instinct, law. Birth, murder. Truth, perjure. Blind, sight, joy, fright, lose, win, repent, sin, virgin, whore, fun, bore, and there's evil, and there's not. The only thing I see when I look at that video is that prison guard sitting there in the back, and I wonder, what was he thinking while this was going on? Like, just another day in the life of a prison guard. After viewing this interview, a renowned Swedish psychiatrist awarded Lunden 39 points of a possible 40 on the psychopathy checklist. One day, 
one dark afternoon, my mother attacked me, and uh, the only thing I did was push her away. I've never laid a hand on my mother, ever. And um, when she fell down, her neck broke. And um, when I say there's, if there's anything I could have done to help her, I would have. I thought it was best to give her a proper burial. And um, the coast of North Carolina is such a beautiful place that uh, it just seemed to fall right into place. I mean, it, uh, it just, at the time, it made sense. I acted out of love. I tried to do the best possible thing I could do. Every man has a demon that lives within him. But uh, to control that demon, that's, uh, that's, the, that's, the, that's the hard part. That's the key. Control, self-control. Did you, in your life, meet the demon within you? Yeah, sure. I met him shaked down. I made love with the demons within me. Words would have been said, but have not been spoken. The eyes say it all. You just got to look at somebody the right way. And they'll know what's up. Kind of vicious or what? Vicious and delicious. What are you? I'm vicious and delicious. As soon as the interview aired, Peter started receiving a lot of letters from women who seemed to have been infatuated with him. Honestly, I would like to know what these girls are thinking when they start communicating with these men. Oh, he killed his mom and showed no remorse. I just love to date him. He even manipulated some of these women into sending him money. He said that during the first few letters he would talk about his childhood and theirs. And then they talk about life in prison, etc. So small talk. And as things progressed and more letters were exchanged, he had told them that he had fallen in love with them and then he asked them to send him money. Peter later appealed his sentencing, saying that the sentence had been too harsh. During the trial, the judge stated that the fact that he strangled his mom was not accidental and that it showed malice, which is why he sentenced him to 20 years. Peter's team appealed based on the fact that the method of strangulation should not have been the only thing used to state malice, but that they should have looked into the background of the family more. Peter then received an opportunity for retrial in 1995. Ola had by this time completed his prison sentence and was living in Denmark again after being deported. He had sent Peter a new suit to wear to the retrial, which Peter had decided to wear without a shirt and his long hair hanging loose. I mean, what the fuck. His lawyer stated that the shirt his father had sent him did not fit and he didn't have anything else to wear. And it was also stated that he wore his hair long because there were no good beauticians at the jail. I'm sure those petitions wouldn't even dare come close to him with a pair of scissors anyway. He'd probably go and ask for a haircut and they'd be like, nope, 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 no, 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 you're not tricking us that way, my guy. Ola had also submitted a letter on behalf of his son, saying that his son should not serve any more jail time as he had suffered enough already. During this retrial, Peter also asked to speak to the reputation of his mom. He said that the case put forth had made his mom look like less of a person than she was. He stated that she was his mother and his friend, and that she had her problems, but she was not a raging drunk. The High Court judge agreed that as tragic as the case might have been, that he could understand how a situation might arise, which would over a number of years build up to something that had brought about what had happened that day between Peter and his mother. The judge came to the conclusion that he did not view it as a premeditated case, but saw it as manslaughter committed under duress. Peter's sentence was then reduced to 15 years. After receiving his reduced sentence, he said he felt good and that it was finally fair. He continued to serve his sentence at the Brown Creek Correctional Institution. During his imprisonment, he wrote some letters to his aunt, who was Ola's sister, with some rather disturbing content. In one of these letters, he writes, I feel like I would have good reason to murder people upon my release. He also admitted that he found the act of murdering someone very enjoyable. He stated that, Killing someone is delicious, delicious, delicious. Yikes. His aunt didn't know how to deal with her nephew's confessions though, and didn't do anything about it. Um, lady, maybe you tell someone about it, write a letter or something, you know, just a thought. They were certainly, um, I call it crazy, 
some of the things he wrote about. Um, sometimes you wonder if it's something he writes just to get a reaction out of people or whether he actually thinks this way. You're never sure. But when I was rereading some of these old letters that he'd written, and he was in North Carolina in prison at that time, um, there was just so much talk about killing. Almost every letter talked about, I need to get out, I need to kill somebody. And it's, it's just a whole way of thinking that, in, in our opinion, is just not normal. In 1996, Peter married one of the women that he was corresponding with. She was a woman named Tina who was also from Denmark. She saw his American Dream interview and she fell in love with Peter while he was on screen. She started writing to him soon after seeing him and in 1996 she flew to America to marry Peter whilst he was still in prison. In 1999, after barely serving half of his sentence, Peter Lunden was released from prison. North Carolina prisons were severely overcrowded at the time, and the authorities therefore had chosen to halve the penalties for anyone who was imprisoned after a certain date. The law at the time did not allow convicts to serve in another U.S. state, so they could not be moved to another prison in another state to finish their sentence. On June 4, 1999, Peter arrived at Copenhagen Airport, escorted by four U.S. police officers. He was seen as a violent offender and they did not want to put anyone on the plane in harm's way. After arriving at the Denmark airport, he was released without any supervision at all. Peter moved in with his wife Tina Lunden and her teenage daughter. He had however remained in contact with many of the other women who had been writing to him whilst he was imprisoned. One of these women sent him 30,000 Danish kroner which he used to buy new clothing and visit brothels upon his arrival in Denmark. He wasn't really committed to his relationship with Tina. He also said that he only married her, so he had a place to stay upon his release from prison. In the fall of 1999, Peter violently attacked Tina and her teenage daughter. By that point, Tina had enough of his BS and threw him out of the apartment. Peter moved into a men's home as he had nowhere to go and whilst living there, he visited a massage clinic that doubled as a brothel in Copenhagen. This is where he subsequently met 36-year-old Marianne Peterson. Marianne had opened the clinic with her late husband years earlier. When her husband passed away, she turned the massage clinic into a brothel on the side and became a sex worker herself, to earn money to support herself and the two sons that she shared with her late husband. Marianne and her two sons, Dennis, 12, and Brian Ten lived in the Copenhagen suburb of Rodevro. Marianne also had a stepson from her marriage who was 24 at the time. Lunden and Marianne subsequently became lovers. However, Peter was still married to Tina at this time. Peter and Tina had also welcomed a son in early 2000, upon which Peter moved back in with Tina. This did not end the relationship between him and Marianne, however. He kept seeing her behind his wife's back. On the 3rd of July 2000, Marianne Peterson and her sons were reported as missing by her older stepson Martin. He contacted police because he was worried. He could not reach Peterson or the boys on their cell phones. A few days earlier, he had also gone to their house and found a note on her front door that said they had gone on vacation and that they would be back on the 28th of July. It was unlike Marianne to not inform anyone that she would be going out of town, and he also said that she would not just leave a note on her door like that. He left, but had a strange feeling that he couldn't shake. Two days later, which was the 3rd of July, he went back to the house, and they had still not returned. He had also learned that Dennis and Brian were supposed to be on a school camp by this time, but that they had never shown up, this is when he decided to go to police and report them as missing. The police arrived to Marianne's house and forced their way inside. They found the home in disarray, with the furniture moved away from the walls and covered in plastic, and they could clearly smell a strong odor of cleaning products. It looked like someone had tried to clean their mess, and they were either still busy with the cleanup, 
or they had just not done it properly. Martin told the police that Marianne would never leave her house looking like that, especially if she had gone on vacation. Upon further investigation and inspection in the house, they had found vomit in both toilets and a strange smell coming from the basement. Police began investigating the disappearance. As the information received from Martin and the way the house was left looked very suspicious. Forensic analysis was done on the house and they found several blood stains that were not immediately visible to the eye. Blood stains were found in Peterson's bed, her car, in the basement and in the garage. Further traces of blood was found between bathroom tiles and even on a chopping board and a blender in the kitchen. The police had suspected that Marianne and her two sons had been murdered inside their house. The police found out that Marianne and her two sons were last seen at the end of year school party on June 16, 2000. She had been seen arguing with a man who had spoken Danish with an American accent, which is when they were led to Peter. On the 5th of July 2000, Lyndon was arrested at his home after they had searched his premises. Tina was arrested as well, as police were informed that she had threatened Marianne on one occasion, after she had found out about her and Peter's affair. During his questioning, he told police that Marianne had taken her kids on holiday, and he had agreed to paint their house whilst they were gone. But police did not believe him. He was asked why he would have Marianne's belongings at his house, for which he had no explanation. He had a lot of cash and a clipping from her passport that contained her photo and signature, as well as a loyalty card in her name from a store that she had often visited. Further forensic tests were done on the house, and the evidence pointed towards Marianne and her two sons being killed and dismembered. A recently cleaned freezer, located in the shed at the Peterson property, also had traces of blood found inside. Faced with all the evidence, Peter later told the police that he had heard screams from the basement late at night between June 16 and June 17, and there he had found the two boys lying on the floor, killed with a knife by Marianne. She was supposedly high on drugs at the time, according to him. When he saw what she had done, he reacted angrily and started to beat her, which was when he had accidentally killed her. He said that he did not call the police as he thought they would not believe his story because of his past and instead he decided to dismember the bodies. On the 19th of June 2000, Lunden went shopping at a metro in Glostrup where he bought an axe, rubber gloves, plastic bags and a lot of cleaning materials. He said that he took their bodies into the bathrooms and dismembered them in the bathtubs and shower by using the axe that he had bought and knives from Marianne's kitchen. He said that he then put some of the body parts in plastic bags, which he placed outside their house as bulky waste, which was thus driven for incineration. He said that at one point, whilst he was cleaning up and not yet finished with the dismemberment, his wife had phoned him and told him to come home, upon which he placed more of the body parts in a bag and in his car and drove back home which is when he wrote the note and put it on the door. He knew that Marianne's stepson or father-in-law were due for a visit with her and the boys soon, and he was not sure when he would be able to return to finish the cleaning. Upon his arrival, he thrown the bag that he had brought home with him down the trash chute, which a neighbor had witnessed. He managed to return to Marianne's house a few days later and was greeted with a pungent smell of human decay. He then decided to put the rest of the body parts that were still in the house inside a freezer until he had time to properly dispose of them. He said that he had not just used the axe, but that he had also gone to his father Ola's apartment, asking to borrow an angle grinder from him, and told him that he would be doing some DIY work at Marianne's house. He knew that the bodies would be frozen by the time that he returned to Marianne's house, and would then use the axe and the angle grinder to continue chopping and grinding up the bodies, and again put the body parts in plastic bags. He cleaned up further and disposed of the plastic bags 
with the rest of the body parts in garbage cans outside his father's apartment. It was reasonably determined that one of the boys was dismembered in the basement and that the other two bodies were mutilated and dismembered in the garage. This did not tie back to what Peter had said. A deputy chief inspector told the press, Both places, meaning the garage and the basement, looked like slaughterhouses, even though Peter had tried to erase his tracks by cleaning up. From remnants of human tissue, the police technicians were able to observe that Lunden had used an angle grinder in the garage, and there were about 100 visible cutting marks on the floor in the basement, revealing that he had used the axe in there. Peter was asked to rethink his version of events, as what he said did not line up with the evidence that had been found. On the 10th of October in 2000, Peter decided to confess to killing Marianne and her two boys himself. He explained that he had an argument with Marianne that had started at the school year end party and continued when they had arrived back at her house. He said that he was angry because he heard her speaking sweetly to another man on the phone. He was overcome with jealousy at that point, and in the heat of the argument, whilst on her bed, he accidentally broke her neck. During that same period that they were scuffling, Dennis had come into the room and tried to help his mom by trying to pull Peter away by his hair which led to Peter breaking Marianne's neck. And then he turned on Dennis and broke his neck as well. Brian had heard the commotion, and he then also entered the room and started fighting with Peter. He bit his hand, and this is when he says he also broke Brian's neck. Peter said the deaths of the children were not dramatic or brutal at all. This is then when he didn't know what to do and he decided to dismember them as he had stated. He maintained that it was an accident and he did not mean to do it. About 10,000 tons of slag was investigated as well as a waste site that carried the waste from that area. With the help of the Danish Emergency Management Agency, the entire Festfolden, which was a rampart complex that stretched around 14 kilometers was searched. Despite all these efforts, the bodies of Marianne, Dennis and Brian have never been recovered. It was later stated that Marianne was not aware of Peter's dark past, and if she had known, she might have not gotten involved with him. Peter's trial started on 5 March 2001. The police and state prosecutors hoped that Lunden would admit his guilt to deliberate manslaughter. However, this did not happen, and the case therefore had to be decided on by three judges and a team of jurors. There had been some concern regarding the influence the outside media might have on the jury and the judges presiding over the case. The murders of Marianne and her sons had been extensively covered in the media in the eight months after Peter had been arrested up to the date that the trial had started. Throughout the trial, Peter Lunden insisted that he did not mean to kill his victims. During the trial, the jury was also shown a video of Lyndon demonstrating how he broke the necks of the two boys. The prosecutor attorney general on the case said, The circumstances, nature and extent of the crimes committed by the defendant are in a state of horror and fright. One can only respond to these as a society and take the right security measures by imposing a lifetime sentence. Lyndon's lawyers made a vigorous effort to get the jurors to sentence his client to a timed penalty of approximately 16 years. He said that he understood that his client's actions had been obnoxious and creepy, but that they were spontaneous and impulsive. Because, of course, yes, killing three people, of which two are children, is just obnoxious and creepy, right? I sometimes wonder about these defense lawyers, honestly. Before the jurors retired to decide on the length of the punishment, Lyndon had the opportunity to say the last words to the jurors, and he of course took the advantage. He said, We must all have peace now. We must have peace in our mind and in our soul. On 15 March 2001, after 10 days of court hearings, Peter Lyndon was sentenced to life imprisonment. 
the sentence was unanimous and came after only 10 minutes of voting. Tina, Peter's then wife, was not charged with anything as the investigation had shown no involvement from her. But again, there was still Ola, Peter's ride or die daddy. Ola was not convicted of complicity or involvement in the disposal of the three bodies. However, he was convicted of theft of several of Marianne Peterson's belongings, which the police had found during a search in his residence while they were investigating the case. Are we sure he knew nothing? Angle grinder, stolen items in his apartment, previous conviction of helping his son dispose of his mom's body? This is of course just my opinion though. Ola Lunden, due to his age and other personal circumstances, would normally only be given a conditional punishment or community service. But regarding the circumstances under which the theft occurred, Ola was sentenced to four months of unconditional imprisonment on June 7, 2002. Upon Peter's guilty verdict, Tina started divorce proceedings. Danish police have subsequently been blamed for not keeping a watchful eye on Peter after he was handed over to Denmark. The US Department of Interpol had routinely informed the Copenhagen police that the four escorting officers from North Carolina were on their way with a murderous man who had been expelled to Denmark after he had finished serving his punishment in the US. The Danish police responded routinely. But since they had nothing outstanding against Lunden in Denmark, they considered him a normal Danish citizen. Even though Peter had been a Danish citizen, he had been considered an American resident who had committed a crime in America at the time of his incarceration. Subsequent to this, no special attention was paid to him after his arrival at Copenhagen Airport on June 4, 1999 which people felt directly led to the murder of Marianne and her two sons. They felt that if Peter had been monitored, that this would not have happened. Peter was placed in the Herstedt Fester prison. He was extremely disliked, and in February 2002, Peter was attacked and beaten by fellow inmates with a frying pan on his head. He filed a case and demanded $10,000 in compensation for the harm done. On April 16, 2002, he was awarded 510 Danish kroner in compensation. In 2006, Peter was caught with some of the green herb in prison and was sentenced to a further 40 days imprisonment. In 2008, Peter married his second wife, Marianne Paulson. How shitty is it that she shared the same name with one of his victims? She became infatuated with Peter after watching an interview on television in 1994, when she was only 15 years old. She then decided to start writing him, and they corresponded on a regular basis for two years, until Marianne was 17. Marianne started to date someone seriously at that point and stopped the communication with Peter. Marianne later got married and had a daughter with her then husband. In 2006, for whatever unknown reason, she decided to pick up contact with Lunden again. She was eager to meet him at least one time in person. And while still married and not telling her husband, she went to the prison to visit Peter. Upon seeing Peter, it was donezo for her. There was no turning back. She was head over heels for the convicted murderer. She visited him several more times and eventually her and her husband got divorced and she married Peter on 28 September 2008. The marriage, however, only lasted for 11 days before she filed for divorce from him. She claimed that he had lied to her about another woman whom he was lovers with while they were married. So basically, the fact that he's a convicted murderer of four people did not mess anything up for her. But um, when she found out that he was cheating, that's where she drew the line. I mean, yeah, I don't even know what to say to that. 
She later did an interview where she stated that her marriage to Peter ruined her life. It led to her first marriage breaking up, and she lost custody of her daughter in the process. In 2009, London and a co-author published a book titled A Murderous Confession. The book is an autobiography in which he talks about his childhood, his close relationship with his mother, and what life is like behind bars. On 26 May 2011, Peter married for the third time whilst incarcerated. She was a woman named Bettina, with whom he started corresponding in 2009. Peter's father and a mutual acquaintance of the two attended the wedding. In November 2011, Lyndon changed his name to Bjorn Skornberg. Who knows why? And he and Bettina welcomed a son in 2014, whilst he was still incarcerated. Upon the establishment of their relationship, they were granted 47 hours alone per month in a visiting apartment in which they conceived their son. On the 28th of February in 2014, Peter, or as he wanted to be known, Bjorn Skornberg, sued two TV hosts for libel. Specifically, he believed that they crossed the line when in September 2012, in a feature on the news, they accused him of being responsible for smuggling the green herb into Herstedfester prison, where he was imprisoned. London's lawyer stated that, False allegations have been set forward against Peter and his wife Bettina. He stated that the presenters have been asked to rectify the statement, but that they refused. Therefore, they had filed a case. Prior to the feature on TV, the TV newspaper was in possession of a report which allegedly revealed that Lunden was the man behind the Green Herb sale in prison. The defamation case took place at the Copenhagen City Court, where Lunden demanded compensation of 25,000 Danish kroner and a correction of the news piece. On the 28th of March, the TV hosts were acquitted of libel against Lunden. At the same time, the court decided that Peter Lunden and his wife Bettina had to pay all the costs of the trial, which amounted to 20,000 Danish kroner within 14 days. Bettina and Peter's marriage ended in divorce in 2017. After the divorce, she told the press that their marriage had been unpleasant. She stated that she did not want her son to see his father ever again because of how he had treated her. She had taken responsibility for her own involvement with Peter, but said that it should have been made harder for her to gain access to a convicted killer. She said that all she had to do was fill out a simple form to gain access to him. She stated that restrictions should be put in place regarding visits that allow these killers to manipulate women. Let this be a lesson to all women out there. A man in prison is most certainly not your soulmate. It never ends well. In 2021, a bill was passed in Denmark prohibiting prisoners serving a life sentence to start a romantic relationship with other people outside the prison system. This bill stops the prisoners' contact with strangers for the first 10 years of their sentence. They may only maintain contact with the family and known friends that they were involved with in their lives pre-imprisonment. There were disgusting examples put forth where these prisoners made contact with young, impressionable girls trying to get their sympathy and attention. This bill was passed to try and stop these prisoners using the prisons as dating centers and to also stop these criminals from using social media platforms to brag about their crimes. They are hoping that this will reduce the groupie or bandy effect associated with known serial murderers. Peter Lunden is known as one of Denmark's most horrific and most talked about murderers in recent times. Up to this day, Peter still maintains that the murders of all his victims were accidents. Peter has never shown clear remorse for the killings of his four victims. Any feelings shown were merely as to how it affected him. If all of this does not point to clear narcissism, then I don't know what does. As of today, Peter is still serving his life sentence at the institution of Herstedt Fester in Denmark. You're just looking really good. I mean, uh, 
Because there is, there is not. Seeing of the flesh blinds of the soul. And because everything has been taken away from me, yet I have seen everything that I really want. I'm truly happy, really, for the first time in my life. I have found true inner peace. I have found joy within myself. I have found myself. And uh, everything in the future is only, every day is only going to get better. I just want to say thank you so much for listening to this case. Thank you for taking the time out of your day. Please give me a like and a subscribe. It's a free way that you can help me out. As always, until next time, bye.